following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Today's lecture is a continuation of the themes we've been building over the last few weeks. We're going to discuss in more detail the transformation of energy, but in, in particular, how our physical organism and our psyche are related to the transformation of energy. Related to this lecture today, we have uh, two diagrams which are available for viewing in the forum at GnosisUSA.com. They're in the Esoteric Physiology section of the website. And we'll be addressing them uh, later on today. So if you have the opportunity to go to the forum, you can bring those up on your screen and be able to look at them as we discuss the, those topics. The title of today's lecture is the Pankatattva Ritual. And this term, Pankatattva, is famous in Hindu Tantrism. And we're going to discuss the meaning of that word shortly. What we're addressing, though, to get started, is the nature of energy and how energy works, how energy is transformed. From the point of view of Gnosis, in fact, any real spiritual tradition, we understand that Everything that exists has its origin in the womb of the Divine Mother. And that womb is that vastness, that emptiness, which we call the Akash or Akasha. And it is, it is a primordial substance, but it is also not a substance. In a sense, you could say it's undifferentiated matter, but it is before matter. It is called Mula Prakriti, which is the great womb of Divine Mother Space. And from that arises anything that exists, anything that manifests. So in synthesis, we're saying that all atoms, all matter, all energy in its root is derived from this womb. That womb is symbolized in the book of Genesis as the waters. Also, in many other traditions, we have the great ocean or the great waters from which life emerges. And you have the same tradition in Hinduism and in some various traditions in Central and South America. Those waters are feminine, and they are the raw material or the raw source of all manifestation. Now, within that, that womb is born a seed that seed 
is the immaculate creation or that immaculate conception from which life emerges. And that seed is fecundated or impregnated by the power of the three forces, the three primary forces, or what we otherwise call the Trinity. In Christianity, we call them the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And these are the holy affirming, the holy denying, and the holy conciling or uh, conciliation. These are the three primary forces. which are required for any level of creation and any level of existence. We call this the law of three. And this law is fundamental on every level of nature. So we see in the very, very beginning, before anything actually manifests, that law of three is there modifying the very process of creation or what we would otherwise call Genesis, to engender, to generate. That first impregnation is performed by the Logos. Logos is a Greek word which means word. And that impregnation causes the condensation or materialization of those forms, those factors rather, into a form. And this is symbolized in the ancient image of the Divine Mother with the child in her arms. This is the beginning of the condensation or materialization of the Divine Mother itself into form. And that form is the child. We know that child as the Christ. And that child has also been called Horus and Quetzalcoatl, many other names. That child is born in order to be crucified. That child is born in order to sacrifice himself. And the meaning there is that that root energy is manifest in order to give itself for the sake of existence. For existence to be, that force must appear and sacrifice its own nature. So in the very beginning of the formation of any level of matter or energy, we have three forces. We have the Divine Mother and we have the Christ. Of course, the symbol of the Christ one of them is the cross. And that symbol has many levels of meaning and is far more ancient than Christianity. It's one of the oldest known symbols to humanity. <clears throat> that light, that Christ, who is the solar logos, that light or energy which manifests from the womb of the Divine Mother is symbolized in ancient religions as the sun. Ra, the sun god, or the solar hero who emerges in order to sacrifice himself, in order to give rise to new creations. We say that the Christ then is light, but spiritual light. This is the ray of creation. Now that ray is really three in one. Because that ray in itself, the Christ, the solar logos, is really that trinity of three forces, but expressing as one. So that's why we say it is a tri-unity. It is three forces which, unified and balanced, produce and create. 
those three, those three forces have their own factors or influences that they bring to bear. And we understand them as positive, negative, and equilibrating. But symbolically or Kabbalistically, we would say that the Father, who's that first force, <clears throat> really is the essence or the root of wisdom. And the Son is really the root or essence of love. And the Holy Spirit, the third force, is that fecundating fire or intelligence. So that solar light, that solar logos, when it arises and manifests in order to produce creation, contains within itself these three aspects. At the very root of matter and energy, the aspect of the third logos, the Holy Spirit, produces in all of creation a polarity, a kind of duality, which we know of as opposites. And it's through this duality or this influence that creation can occur. We see that in the very root of matter, that in order to produce light, we have to have the interaction of hydrogen atoms and carbon atoms. And these are complementary substances that when they interact with one another, light is created. That is a function of the Holy Spirit who impregnates nature and matter and energy with that essential duality. And within that essential duality arises the opportunity for a new substance to be born. That is symbolized in the cross itself, which is made up of two lines which interact with one another, which cross one another. They complement each other. And those symbolize positive and negative or male and female forces who, when unified, produce something new. When we look at how matter arises, we understand that the root of matter itself is this light, the light of the solar logos. We have, if we were to, to visualize this, we first see the universal spirit of life, which is that vastness of undifferentiated matter or non-existence. Below that, separate from that, we have the realms of matter, which are all the different dimensions that we know, separate from the zero or seventh dimension. Between these realms, of the universal spirit of life and matter is a bridge. And this bridge is really the first manifestation of matter. But it exists between these two worlds. And this is called in Gnosis, hydrogen. A hydrogen is the first element or first formation of matter. And the, the word hydrogen has in its components hydro, which is water, and gen, which is related to generate or genesis. Now, hydrogen in scientific terms is the simplest component on our table of elements. And so this is congruent with what Gnosis teaches about the nature of matter. That hydrogen, in the way we use the term hydrogen, is the simplest form of matter. And it's through modifications of this one form that all matter exists. Every atom, every structure, is really just combinations of varying forms of hydrogen. 
hydrogen that is modified by the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons that it has. And those hydrogens combine with other elements in order to produce more and more complicated forms of matter. Each of those elements is attracted sexually to its complement. So we find, for example, that sodium is attracted sexually to chlorine, which, when combined, produces salt. So this combination of complementary elements resides in the very root of atomic structures. And from that level is consistent all the way up until the creation of galaxies and universes. All levels of creation rely upon sexual attraction from the atomic level to the universal level. And this is a fundamental axiom upon which rests the entire structure of existence. That is symbolized in the symbol of the cross. Again, the cross shows us two crossed beams which are interacting with each other. And when that interaction is active, that cross moves and that spinning cross, or inflamed cross, is what we call a swastika. A swastika is actually a very ancient symbol, which has been present in traditions around the world. And unfortunately, it was misused by some folks in Europe in the last century. But that symbol is far more ancient than uh, those people. And it's a holy symbol. Now, the cross if we break it down, it really has four parts. These four separate arms that extend from a central point. Those four points symbolize the basic four elements that we know, which are air, earth, water, and fire. But they also relate to this word, the tetragrammaton. And tetragrammaton in Greek simply means the four-lettered word, or the word with four parts. And this refers to the holy name of God, yod He vau He. These are four Hebrew letters, and every Hebrew letter is symbolic. Yod is masculine and symbolizes the male sexual organ, or the phallus. He is feminine and symbolizes the uterus. Vau is also masculine and symbolizes the man, also the spinal column. And He again is feminine, which in this case would be the woman. So the cross, when analyzed from the point of view of tetragrammaton, really demonstrates the sexual relationship that exists in all levels of nature. Crucified upon that cross is the Christ, that solar light. So symbolically, we always see the Christic heroes or solar heroes are crucified, which is a symbol of the very point of existence for that light. The Christ exists in order to sacrifice itself for the benefit of creation and existence. Likewise, all the solar heroes and solar gods, the bodhisattvas, sacrifice themselves for the benefit of all other creatures. And that is the very point of the existence of the human being, is to learn how to become that perfect sacrifice. And that's why we have the symbol of the Christ symbol or sacrificed on the cross. Now, the four letters, there are also another four letters related to the cross, which are INRI, I-N-R-I, which is a symbolic term that hides varying levels of meaning. But one very important one is Ignis Natura Renovator Integra, which is Latin, and when translated, it means the fire renews nature incessantly. 
And that fire, of course, is the fire or solar light of the Christ. It is that fire of the Holy Spirit, which is constantly renewing nature through its sacrifice. And of course, that's symbolized on the cross. So when we see the cross with those letters I-N-R-I, we're seeing a symbol of the very structure of existence. That in every atom, in every form of matter and energy, the Christ is there, sacrificing its forces so that that matter can manifest. Now, for us to understand this a little clearer, we're going to look at it from another angle. That energy, that root energy or that light, which vibrates in the infinite, is called in Sanskrit prana. That energy, in the process of its manifestation, radiates or sounds. It produces a vibration. And every vibration is both of sound and light. That vibration, that energy, begins to condense. And it condenses next into akash, which is the next most dense level. That akash condenses further into ether. And that ether then begins to differentiate itself and unfold itself into what we call the tattvas. Tattva is spelled T-A-T-T-V-A. -T -T and there are four types. There's Vayu, Apas, Tehas, and Pritvi. Now, Tattva means suchness or essence of. So we understand that a tattva is a modification of ether. An ether is just a condensation of more subtle forms of light or energy. These four tattvas further condense themselves and they become what we know of as the four elements in physical matter. Vayu becomes water. That's actually, yeah, Vayu is air. I was thinking that was wrong. My notes are wrong. Apas is water. Tehas is fire. And Pritvi is earth. These four elements crystallize in the physical world and form the very basis for all the forms of matter that we know physically. This is why when you examine the philosophies of the ancient Greeks, they always refer to the four elements. And when you refer to the alchemists of the Western traditions, they also refer to the four elements. They understood, but may not have written, that the four elements are simply modifications of tattvas, which derive from ether, which derive from akash, which derive from prana. This becomes important because all of these varying levels are really forms of energy or light which fuel the proper functioning of creation. The first material concrete element that crystallizes from prana is hydrogen. And that is the first crystallization of prana, that light. The hydrogen is, as we said, the simplest element and is the root of all existing matter and energy. For us in alchemy, we really call all forms of matter hydrogen. But we assign them different numbers according to their relative density. So the reason we do this is to understand how matter is differentiated, not so much by the content of its atoms, but by its relative density or its weight. 
these three primary forces, which we discussed, crystallize in hydrogen. And from that come all the other atoms, hydrogens, electrons, etc., to make all of the elements. And those root elements, of course, are the very nature of our own well-being. All elements that exist are the result of transformations of hydrogen, different forms or combinations of hydrogens. So, what we need to understand then is that in everything that we as a physical organism interact with is in its root the Christ, that solar light, that solar light which sustains everything that exists. But that energy is always being modified according to the processes through which it passes. So, for example, our physical body requires elements in order for it to be sustained. Likewise, our psyche, our consciousness, requires elements in order for it to be sustained. And this is where we get the point of this whole lecture. We need food. We need air. We need water. We need these elements in order to fuel our continued existence. And this is an exchange or transformation of energy which is required in order for us to remain manifested in this level of nature. And we know very well that if we stop eating, we will stop being manifested in this level of nature. And we know very well that if we stop drinking water, we will also cease to exist in this level of nature. And the same is true of air. What we examine in Gnosis is precisely how this impacts the purpose and point of our existence. To ingest food is a requirement for us to live. Food, in Gnosis, is assigned the value of hydrogen DO 768. Now, DO is a note. DO is the first note on the octave of seven notes. The law of seven is that fundamental law of, of creation which organizes everything that the law of three produces. So we have light which exists, but that light is modified by the law of seven. And we have sound which exists, but that sound is modified by the law of seven, which is the law of the octave. This is why we have uh, seven chakras, seven bodies, seven notes, seven bodies. There are many levels upon which the law of seven is manifest. So we look at the scale, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, and we examine how energy is managed by that law of seven in our organism. So the first note is do. When we eat food to sustain our physical body, we take food, and that food is assigned the relative value or density of do 768. The number 768 refers to the relative weight or density of that food or that substance in relation to prana. If prana is the most simple form of substance, which manifests as hydrogen, hydrogen has a value of 1. So 768 is 768 times away in modification or in relative density or weight. You could also put it another way. 768 could be seen as a number of laws or modifying factors. So in synthesis, we can say that hydrogen do 768 is very complex, is very dense. And that's why our body needs to digest the food. This is why we have the digestive system. We have the digestive system in order to break down those compound elements and to extract from them 
those elements that we need to sustain the physical body. So our entire digestive system is a, is a physiological process which is managed by the intelligence of the being through our three brains, through the instinctive system. And that energy directs itself onto that hydrogen in order to break it down, to extract the important elements and to uh, throw away the ones that are not needed. The energy that's saved from that, the energy that's extracted, in other words, the hydrogens or that light, is then passed on to another system which will process it further. That system we know as the respiratory system. In other words, we breathe. We take in oxygen, air, all those gases that we need to sustain the physical body. With that process of breath, we're drawing in prana. We're drawing in hydrogens, but more elevated hydrogens than the hydrogens of, that are in food. And those prana, that energy that we're drawing in through the breath, is combined and utilized in order to further break down the elements that come from food. So at this point, the hydrogens that the body is working to process are assigned the note Re, which is the second note, and the relative density of 384. So here we see in these first two notes two very mechanical processes that every physical organism must sustain in order to continue existing in their level of nature. All organisms eat, and most organisms require air of some kind, particularly us, which is the topic at hand. Now, if we take in bad food, or food that isn't really food, like fast food or Coca-Cola, or alcohol, those elements do not contain the pure atoms of the solar logos because they are not real food or they are rather poisonous. So we will not extract anything beneficial from that. In fact, we may be drawing in harmful elements from those substances. In the same way, when we breathe air that's not clean or we smoke, we're drawing in elements that are not beneficial for the organism. In fact, they're harmful. So the process of extracting pure atoms for the well-being of our organism is arrested and corrupted by the very elements that we take in. We all know very well that we are what we eat. And the truth of this is going to become more and more clear to you. If, however, we're managing to eat some good food and breathing some decent air, the extracted elements are then passed on to another system, which we know of as the circulatory system. So the air and oxygen that we breathe in through the lungs is combined and added into the circulation of the blood through the body. And in the blood, we have the elements that the digestive system has extracted. And so the hydrogens that the body is working to transform are at this point at the note me with the relative weight of 192. Now the, the heart, in combination with the lungs, is really purifying the blood. It's purifying the elements that are processed through the circulatory system in order to feed the organism with those elements. The synthesis, or the ultimate extraction from the process of the purification process in the circulatory system is a kind of food or energy which is then passed on to the brain. This is where we get the next note. The brain, or the transformations of energies that occur in the brain, is related to the note fa and the relative value of 96. So you can see in just four steps how quickly the weight of the hydrogens has decreased. We're dealing with more and more subtle more and more pure forms of energy. 
Now, the energies that the brain relies on to be nourished and to be healthy are derived from the circulatory system, the respiratory system, and from the food that we take in. This means that whatever the heart processes directly affects the health of the brain. Our heart is closely related with our emotions. And our brain is closely related with our thoughts. So we can understand then how important it is to have a good sense of what's going on in our psyche. To have a good idea and have control over the, our own feelings and our own thoughts. And we know very well that people that are sick in their heart end up sick in the body and sick in the mind as well. Now the brain, of course, is the vehicle of the mental body. The brain is the vehicle of thought. The brain is not the mind itself. It's the organ that the mind uses. The brain is closely related, of course, with the cerebrospinal nervous system. And this nervous system is a processor of energy, a transformer of energy. And the energy that directly influences the health and function of the cerebrospinal nervous system is the influence of the Father, our own inner divinity, our own Father, who is one aspect of that trinity which we discussed related to the creation of the hydrogen. What we need to understand there is that our own process of thought, the way we think, the way we receive impressions from life, influences not only the health of our body and mind, but how in our organism. The meaning is, as the body is transforming the energies from the food, from the air, from the water, up through to feed the brain, the, all that hydrogen, that purified element, is combined with the nature of energy that we take in through impressions that we receive and through the types of impressions. That is, we're watching images of violence or pornography, or we're feeding ourselves with negative emotions, negative thinking, defeatist types of thoughts, or critical thinking, blaming others. That energy is directly influencing and impregnated within the transformation of hydrogens inside of the organism. The re result of the transformations that occur in this level the, whatever energy can be purified and sent on to the next level then descends through the spinal column, which is related to the note soul and has the relative value of 48. Now the spinal column, of course, is related to our motor instinctive processes, or our motor processes, rather. It's also closely related to the grand sympathetic nervous system. And this system is directly related with our emotional well-being and with the astral body. Now in this case, most of us don't have an actual solar astral body. We have a lunar astral body, which is also called the Kama Rupa. The Kama Rupa is a Sanskrit term for the body of desire. If we are enjoying the influences of our own desires that process through our instinctive nature, through our animal nature related to the spinal column, and through the desires that arise in our heart, then the energies of those desires, those instincts, will then influence the transformation of hydrogens within our organism. So, whatever energy is then processed at the level is then passed on into the endocrine system, which is closely related to the vital body, or the body of energy. 
Now, the endocrine system, of course, is where we are producing hormones. And this is the note La with the value of 24. So this is already a very refined energy. And we know that our system of hormones in the endocrine system is an extremely powerful and potent energy in our organism. The endocrine system is where we find all the hormones and those forces which push and generate many types of behavior and forms of creation within our organism. This level of our psyche is related to dreams, related to the health of the vital body. The vital body, being the superior part of the physical body, is the body of energy. It's that vehicle through which all the metabolic and chemical processes are enabled in the physical body. And the vital body, when the physical body is sleeping, the vital body is charging itself with solar light through the chakras. So it's receiving energies when we rest. And those energies, which fuel the vital body, are then used to restore the physical body and are combined with the energies that we create and transform through the processes that we've already described. Eating, breathing, the circulatory system, etc. So at this level, at Law 24, we have this combination of energies. The result of all the digestive, respiratory, and circulatory processes through the spinal column and the brain, combined with the energies that the vital body is drawing in, all that energy is very refined, very powerful, very potent. And if you compare that with fuel that we use to drive vehicles, we would say this is already an extremely high octane, very potent, very powerful, very dangerous type of energy. This level of energy related to the note La is related to our parasympathetic nervous system, which is the instinctive nervous system, which manages, of course, all the previous processes which have arised in our discussion. That system is controlling the motor and instinctive processes of the body under the intelligence of the vital body. And that energy is directly related to the Holy Spirit. Now, what you see then is in Fa, Sol, and La, we have the three nervous systems of our organism. And we have the three factors or the three forces of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we have the mental, astral, and vital bodies. So we have the law of three combined together in a very powerful way. And harnessed, what those, that law of three is harnessing through these different vehicles is all the energies that we've been receiving and transforming as an organism, both physically and on more subtle levels. What is the point of all of that? All of that energy, all of that work, all of that mechanical nature, which has been given to us as a gift, has as its purpose the creation of the next most powerful level, right? The most subtle element, most potent element, which is the note C or T. With the value 12, this is the hydrogen T12, which is sexual energy. The sexual energy is the end result of all the transformative processes which exist in our organism. We combine together and analyze the digestive system, circulatory, respiratory, all the three nervous systems, meaning all the intake we have of thought, feeling, emotion, and will. All of that combines to produce in us what we have as our own personal sexual force. The purity and potency and value of that sexual energy is derived from our behavior. The purity and potency of our sexual energy is a direct result of the food we eat, the air we breathe, the thoughts we think, the feelings we have, and the behaviors that we engage in. When we eat anything, we take the elements from that food 
And the physical body, through its varying processes, extracts the best of that food. And the end result of that is sexual energy. When we breathe, the same process occurs. When we drink water, the same process occurs. However, when we begin to bring our own will into the equation, we begin to change the natural functioning of the organism. This whole transformative process is really alchemy. Alchemy is a compound word. The first part is al, A-L, which is related to the Hebraic, or, uh, Arabic word for God, Allah, or spirit. And that is closely related, of course, with the Hebrew term El, which means God. Chem is derived from a Greek word, chemia, which means to fuse or cast a metal. When you combine the term God with fuse or cast a metal, you come up with this term alchemy, which means to fuse our metal with God. The metal that we have is mercury. And mercury is a symbol of sexual energy. Our own mercury is that stone upon which the temple is built. The purity and quality of our mercury is an end result of our own behavior. If we eat impure food, if we drink impure water, such as alcohol, or chemical food, like Coca-Cola and sodas and all these drinks that are being manufactured for us, these things do not have any nutritional value. They do not have any solar light because they are chemicals. They are false creations. And that energy of those hydrogens are of a very heavy density which contain no real solar light. So when we ingest them, we feed ourselves nothing. That's why when people eat and drink these substances, they become very sick. The physical body falls into decrepitude into illnesses, and the mind degenerates. What you will notice if you examine the history of this humanity is that since the time we began to eat heavily processed, chemically altered food, the psyche of humanity has transformed radically. What is the result? We have lost our modesty. We have lost our sense of what is upright. We have become very degenerated. So in Gnosis we understand that we have the obligation to try to take in pure food, pure water, pure air. And these are a good foundation to begin to produce a better energy, a more healthy body, a more healthy mind. But more importantly is to work with and control our psyche. Because the energies that we receive and transform through the impressions of life that we receive from external sources and the impressions that we generate within ourselves are more subtle and more powerful than the energies derived from food, air, and water. And those energies of impressions have a direct effect on the quality of the transformation of our sexual forces. When we examine this in detail, we understand that what we really need is to comprehend how to transform energies in a balanced and healthy way. There's a teaching in the Hindu Tantras, which is called the Pankatattva Ritual. Panka it's a Sanskrit word which means five. And tattva is a Sanskrit word which means truth, suchness, true being. And we understand that a tattva is a vibration of the ether, which in its, way, which in its place is a transformation or vibration of prana or solar light. So, Pankatattva refers to five 
vibrations, or five types of energy. And a ritual, of course, is any science to transform energy. The Catholic Mass, the Buddhist ritual, the Aztec ritual are all forms of science which are, exist in order to transform the solar light, to transform prana into something else, in order to sustain something. In this case, rituals exist to transform the solar light, the prana, the energy of the Christ, into a type of food or fuel which will feed the consciousness, It'll feed the soul. So the Pankatattva ritual is then a science to transform energies to feed the soul. This ritual refers to uh, what they sometimes call the five M's. The first is Madhya in Sanskrit. Madhya means wine. And what we're talking about when we talk about wine in this case is the grape. Grapes are very symbolic in many traditions, and wine is very symbolic in many traditions. Wine is a symbol of the blood of the Christ, a symbol of that fire or that energy that we need in order to sustain ourselves. And in the terms of madhya, this Sanskrit term, what we're talking about is the vibration of that solar light which manifests through the tattva of vayu, which we know of as air. So the alchemist, or the tantrika, consumes the grape, or grape juice, and does so in order to receive the purest and most potent hydrogens related to the tattva vayu. And that pure energy is taken in as part of the process of transforming the energies of the organism, organism in order to produce sexual energy. The next M is mamsa, which means meat. And meat is related to the tattva tehas, which is fire. So the alchemist, or tantrika, consumes red meat, beef, lamb, goat, this type of uh, animal flesh which contains the fire of the tattva tehas, which is, of course, a vibration of ether. Further, we have matsya, which is related to fish. And obviously, this is the tattva apas, which is related to the waters. Fish, in their physical bodies, contain that hydrogen, that element, which is related to that tattva, which our organism needs in order to bring to bear all the influences necessary to produce the purest and most perfected sexual energy. The next M is mudra, which is related to the grains of the earth. And this, of course, is pritvi, or the earth element. So mudra is related to grains, vegetables, and fruit. These four M's, Madhya, Mamsa, Matsya, and Mudra, relate to four types of physical food, each of which contains hydrogens related to the four of the main tattvas. And those hydrogens are very pure energies which can help in the creation and elaboration of the sexual force that we have within our organism. These five are combined with the fifth M, which is Matuna. 
Matuna means intercourse or sexuality. And this is where we have the transmutation of the ether itself. These five are the condensation of the akash, the prana, the solar light. By eating these five modifications of the akash, we're taking the full range of the vibrations of the solar light in matter. Because you remember that all matter is derived from those four elements, those four tattvas. And combined with the ether, we then are taking into the organism the root hydrogens of matter itself. This is how we develop an equilibrated influence. the equilibrated energies or complete set of energies that we need in our organism in order to transform the sexual energy. By this means, the alchemist, the tantrika, is able to realize the very purpose of his or her life. We exist in order to fulfill the mission of that solar light. The solar light, or the Christ, has sacrificed itself and produced creation in order to create solar humanity. A solar man or a solar woman is an embodiment of that Christic force, is the very reflection of that Christic force. And as we are now, we are a lunar manifestation. That is, we are mechanical. We belong to the processes of the moon or nature. We have not conquered nature. In order to conquer the elements of nature, to have power over the creatures and animals and processes and functions of the fire, the water, the air, and the earth, we have to command those elements within ourselves. And we gain that power we gain that intelligence by consuming those forces and by being instructed by the Christ himself through his messengers in how to command the elements of nature. If we do not work with the grain, how can we command the grain? If we do not work with the waters, how can we command them? We have to work with them, comprehend them, digest them, conquer them in order to be what we've been called to be, which is kings and queens of nature, which is in the Bible. That journey of the solar light from the undifferentiated absolute through all the varying levels and dimensions ends in the sexual energy within our organism. The human physical body is the most supreme creation in mechanical nature. Lunar mechanical nature reaches its peak with the human organism. But that is not the peak of existence. It is not the peak of all creation. Beyond the human organism, we have many levels of existence. But one can only enter those levels if one conquers lunar mechanical nature and transcends those laws. That is accomplished by commanding and controlling nature within ourselves. And that's fueled by the most potent and powerful energy we have available to us, which is naturally the sexual force. When we work with the power of the cross, we use the forces of the Holy Spirit, that fire, which manifests the opposites, the attraction of opposites. Then we work with the power between the man and the woman. When combined, they activate and inflame the cross, which becomes that living, inflamed swastika. And that is the root of creation. 
if the male and the female have worked to perfect in themselves the body's creation of sexual energy, meaning they eat right, they manage the impressions they take in, and they work with their own consciousness, and they transform and transmute their sexual force, then combined, male and female, that sexual energy enters a new octave. This first octave we've described, from Do to T, is an octave of mechanical nature. If we spill the sexual energy, meaning we experience the orgasm, we extract that pure energy from the body and we lose it. We no longer can work with it. It's gone. And as such, we remain in the level in which we currently are. We remain a slave of the forces that control us, the forces of nature. If, however, we save that energy, we transform it, we transmute it, that energy can enter into a new octave and realize new creations. And those creations are called the solar astral body, the solar mental body, and the solar causal body. Those new creations are the, in the result, they are the soul. This is how one is born again. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That is, it's a physical body. That which is born of the spirit, the Holy Spirit, is spirit. That is, the soul. So, the synthesis is that we have to learn how to work with the five M's. We consume the foods related to these four primary tattvas. And when we consume them, we have to do so consciously. With conscious attention, meaning being present, being aware of what we're doing. Because the consciousness is our only direct connection with our own inner divinity. If we're not aware of ourselves, if we're not present, observing ourselves and remembering ourselves, we're asleep. So by bringing the force of the consciousness, we bring that energy to bear upon all the transformations that we need to achieve. So when we eat, we consume these elements, we do it with consciousness. And that allows us to, be, to have a more pure, more effective transformation of those hydrogens. And we combine that conscious attention with a mantra, which is cream, K-R-E-E-M, or K-R-I-M, or K-R-Y-M. You can spell it however you want. But it's pronounced cream. <clears throat> that mantra helps to bring those forces to focus on the transformation of those elements. So the alchemist, the tantrika, eats, drinks, and breathes with that mantra. As we eat the food, we eat our meat and our fish and our grains, we pronounce that mantra inside, and we vibrate our organism with that sound in order to influence the transformation of those elements. Likewise, we use this mantra cream in the matuna, in our sexual transmutation. This mantra is very potent and is especially good for dissolving unwanted elements and extracting the wanted ones. In other words, you want to transform a food and take what's good from it, use the mantra cream. If you want to destroy an ego and extract the consciousness, use the mantra cream. By means of this Pankatattva ritual, the five M's, we are in truth worshipping the Divine Mother. And that's why she's pictured in the center of the graphic. If you read any Hindu tantras, they will tell you that the Pankatattva ritual is for the purpose of worshipping Devi, or the Divine Mother. And now you understand why. By properly transforming and receiving 
all the elements, the hydrogens, related to the tattvas, we are using the gift of the Divine Mother in the right way. We were receiving it consciously, with gladness, and recognizing the sacrifice that she has made and that her son, the Christ, has made on our behalf. If we proceed in life the way we are, asleep, we do not recognize that gift, and thus we're not able to fully take advantage of it. So the Pankatatva ritual, in its synthesis, expresses to us how to take advantage of the energies in nature and in ourselves in order to transform ourselves into something greater. So, do we have any questions? Uh-huh. How do you follow something like that? Okay. There are certain um, writers who've expressed this uh, occult or tattvic timetable, which is a way of codifying or um, making into a diagram the manifestations of the tattvas in nature around us, so through the course of the day. And in fact, in one of Samael Unwer's books, he expressed a tattvic timetable. He later renounced that and wrote that the best tattvic timetable is to simply observe nature. Because when it's rainy, the tattva that is manifesting is water, atvas. And when it's dry, it's not, right? When it's hot out, you have tehas being very strong. So he simplified. He said, you don't need complicated tables in order to calculate which tattvas are most predominant. Yes. So, you are saying that in order to have a good quality of energy, we need to consume all the tatwas? Right. In order for us to take advantage of the mechanical nature that we have, we need to feed it the best possible elements. So, if you want to build something, you need to make sure you have the best possible parts. Otherwise, the end result will not be strong. It won't be robust. The sexual energy is the most perfect refinement of the solar light within mechanical nature. And that, that energy is a result of that condensation or materialization of the akash and the prana and the tattvas. So when we take those varying modifications of the prana and we combine them back again in order to be resolved into one perfected form, then we're making the strongest possible end result. Another question. When the energy enters the new octave, does the hydrogen C12 break down further to 6 or 3 when you transmute it? Okay. The energy transforms into a new octave. So the notes change and the values change. What happened with uh, vegetarianism? They only work with vegetables. Okay. So the question is, what about vegetarians? Well, vegetarians eat all the elements except perhaps fish and meat. The end result is that their sexual force lacks potency. They, of course, still produce sexual energy. It simply does not have the same value as the sexual energy which has been incorporated with the hydrogens of meat and fish. That means that the vegetarian will not have as much force. They will not have as much fuel, as much energy. Now, vegetarianism has been widely admired in many spiritual and religious traditions. In fact, Samael Anwior himself was a vegetarian for a period of time, but he later discovered in order for him to make good progress in his work, he needed fire. 
The work itself is founded upon fire. And for him to realize and manifest that fire fully, he needed that element, the tattva. So he consumed meat. In like manner, His Holiness the Dalai Lama made more or less the same type of statement. That he said he admires vegetarianism because on an ethical basis, it's a good idea. But practically speaking, he is not a vegetarian because he needs the fuel of meat. Do the solar bodies form automatically when the energies are transformed correctly? Okay. No. Mechanical nature stops at the level of the human organism. To create beyond that level requires the intelligence of the Holy Spirit, which is not mechanical at all. It's a divine intelligence. The solar bodies are produced by the wisdom and intelligence of the Christ, through the being and by means of the powers of the Holy Spirit. That creation is a creation based on conscious works and voluntary sufferings or sacrifices in the example of the Christ. That means that one can transmute, one can use the Pankratatva ritual, but if one is not satisfying the requirements, moral requirements, ethical requirements, initiatic requirements of the Christ himself, those creations can never be realized. The creation of those bodies is related directly with what we call the four ordeals. We will discuss them more in detail. But in general, we say that the four ordeals are types of tests related to the four elements. And of course, those elements are the basis of creation, the basis of matter. So when we're trying to create bodies or entities in more subtle levels of nature, we also are founding them upon the balance of those four elements. But in this case, it's psychological. And we'll get into that in more detail later. Yes? Should you have all the top was in place in each meal, or can you have a breakfast of earth and air and then a dinner of fire and water? Uh, The way you combine the elements is really up to the individual. There are, there are um, codified versions of the Pankatatva ritual where you actually use a representative of each tattva within a ritual and consume them as a symbol. But in terms of your daily dietary requirements, it's up to you. Just make sure that you're over a weekly basis or a bi-weekly basis that you're consuming the variety of those foods in balance. Depends on how fast you consume them. And when you're hungry, you're hungry, right? So if you eat a meal, a few hours later you'll be hungry, which means that those elements have been consumed. In the same way, for the creation of the sexual energy and the superior bodies, we need to constantly be drawing in energy. Yes? The Master Samael stated that the best time to eat a meal is during the Tatwa Pridvi. Did he renounce that? Insofar as I'm aware, the best time to eat a meal is when you're hungry. In some of his writings, Samaya Lambert says not to eat meat every day. Does this apply when performing the Pankatatwa ritual? Meat is something that has to be managed with discretion. The reason is that it contains fire, which is a very potent element. If someone is a beginner in their transmutation practice, it's wise for them to be cautious about how much meat they consume. Because eating too much can give them too much fire and cause them to fail and have problems. On the other hand, someone who has experience with transmutation and has learned about their own psychological limits is able to consume more fire. So it's really a matter of individual experience. What about pork? (laughs) Pork is uh, the flesh of a degenerating animal. 
which means it's an animal that is uh, descending upon the um, devolving side of nature. Its flesh contains the hydrogens related to the elements or psychological elements which are embodied in that creature. Therefore, to consume that energy is very damaging for the alchemist or tantrika who wants to self-realize. It's highly advisable to avoid pork if possible because that hydrogen or those forces will complicate the um, perfection of your own sexual forces. In the book Intro to Gnosis, it states there are two other tatwas named Adi and Samadhi. Can you explain where these fit into the chart? Yes. Adi and Samadhi tatva are two superior forms of tatvas. They are superior modifications of the ether, <clears throat> which are related to <clears throat> the superior centers that we have within. And uh, they will be discussed in a later lecture. Where does chicken fit? Chicken is just a food that we eat. I really don't know about the tatvas. Uh, the master, as far as I know, didn't address that. We eat it. I mean, we eat chicken and we like it. But in, in terms of the tatvas, when we say meat, we mean red meat. So the master ate chicken, but as far as its tatvic value, I have no clue. Any other questions? Yeah, where is everybody? Okay. We have listeners from Connecticut, Texas, New Zealand, Sweden, West Virginia. That's great. Welcome to everybody. Well, that will be it for the lecture today. I hope you will all join us again for the next lecture, and I wish to extend our thanks again to all of those who are making this possible, and of course to the listeners who are also making it possible. Thank you, and we will see you next time. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah,